The whole glycemic index thing, like how high a carbohydrate spikes your glucose is really kind of misleading because it sort of implies that if you eat something that's high glycemic, it's automatically terrible for you. And it's not exactly how it works because you could potentially eat something that's relatively high glycemic, but pair it with a food that lowers the glycemic index and you would ultimately be fine. For example, if you have mashed potatoes, mashed potatoes are high glycemic, but once you add butter to the mashed potatoes, well, then it actually attenuates that glucose response. But there's a big glaring problem. We don't just wanna add fat to everything, right? Combining fats and carbohydrates is something that is up for debate in terms of if it's good or not, right? For example, there was a study that was published in the journal Cell that demonstrated that our mitochondria really like to metabolize one fuel at a time. In other words, they like to metabolize carbohydrates independently and they like to metabolize fats independently. And when you start combining these energy sources, you can end up with what is called metabolic gridlock, where basically the signaling pathways for each independent energy source are so antagonistic, it makes the cell kind of frustrated. The other side is when you combine carbohydrates and you spike your insulin, along with fat, what happens is the insulin ends up increasing what's called lipoprotein lipase. Now, I know this sounds like I'm going down gobbledygook rabbit hole, but in essence, when insulin spikes from carbohydrates, you have more potential to store fat as well from the fat that is being consumed. So it's best to not have copious amounts of carbs and copious amounts of fats together. Of course, you can have little bits here and there. I mean, that'd be crazy to say you can't, but don't go loading up on fats and carbs at the same time. So then how do we lower the glycemic effect of carbohydrates? Well, there's some really interesting things that you can add in. Jumping right into it, the first one is curcumin, like from turmeric. It's wild. But the reason that this has an effect is it impacts what is called pancreatic amylase. Now, amylase is an enzyme that breaks down starch chains. When glucose is bound together, it is called a starch chain, and our body has to break apart these little glucose molecule binds, okay, these glycosidic bonds, breaks them down, and this is how you end up with a glucose spike. Okay, well, if you inhibit the ability to break those glucose bonds apart, then you don't spike your glucose as high. So there's something in curcumin called bis curcumin, and there was a study that was published in the journal Food Chemistry that took a look at this specifically. It found that it does indeed inhibit pancreatic amylase, but in addition to that, it is what is called a non-competitive inhibitor. This doesn't sound like much, but it actually is, because it means that you can have a little bit of curcumin with even a small amount of carbohydrates, not even a large amount of starch, and it can actually slow the digestion and slow down the breakdown of that glucose. So a little bit of curry powder, curcumin, with some carbohydrates, like in your potatoes or in your rice, does make a pretty large impact leading me into the next simple thing you can add to carbohydrates, cinnamon. Okay? It's a little bit similar, but a little bit different. You see, this works because it's what is called a procyanidin. Now, I'll explain what that means. So what these procyanidins do is they directly block... Uh, so what these procyanidins do is they directly block amylase. So they're not a non-competitive inhibitor. They just flat out block it. Interestingly enough, there was a study that was published in the journal Phytomedicine. It found this really cool. Okay, they took a look at subjects eating rice pudding, which if you ever had rice pudding before, it's actually delicious, but it's got starch in it from the rice and it's got sugar in it, so it's pretty sweet. Okay, and they had people eat the rice pudding or rice pudding with three grams of cinnamon in it. Well, guess what? The group that had the cinnamon ended up having a significantly lower glucose spike. Okay, and they ended up finding there was a reduced amount of insulin. So a reduced insulin concentration, meaning less insulin was required to keep the glucose stable. This is ideal. We want to be able to have a nice insulin response, a nice small blip on the radar, and then come back to normal. The next one that's super wild is sweet potatoes. Now sweet potatoes are a carb in and of themselves, but they contain something that is an alpha glucosidase inhibitor, which is a completely different type of bond of glucose. When glucose is bound together, there are these glycosidic linkages, okay? So even if you had two glucose molecules bound together, there would be a glycosidic linkage in between. Alpha-glucosidase comes in and breaks that linkage up. Well, sweet potatoes contain a blocker of alpha-glucosidase. So in a way, independent of these other things I've talked about, sweet potatoes can really impact this. So you know what a tremendous combination would be? 
sweet potatoes, and cinnamon because you're working the amylase inhibitor route and the alpha glucosidase route. Pretty wild stuff. Now, if you want to get super nerdy about it, there was a study that was published in the Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry and it found that it is what is called the anthocyanins, what is giving the sweet potatoes a purplish pigment that is doing the job. So the more purple the sweet potato, the better. Okay, then we have buckwheat. This is a simple one. Buckwheat is just going to have some compounds in it that slow down the carb digestion. So another study in Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry took a look at equal parts wheat flour bread and buckwheat flour bread. The wheat flour bread, nice glucose and insulin spike. Buckwheat flour bread, practically no spike, just a nice gentle bell curve. Something to keep in mind there. Now the interesting thing is, before I get into the world of tannins and foods that have tannins, you can start testing different foods yourself and compare things yourself. Like for example, if I have a little bit of ice cream, and believe it or not, if I have fruit in my ice cream, my glucose doesn't spike as much. Now you're probably like, how do I know this? Okay, I wear a continuous glucose monitor. That's what this is, okay? So it's from a company called Cygnos. I'll explain in a second. But I wear a CGM so I can, in real time, I can watch this. So I do my own experiments all the time. So yes, literal ice cream with like a half a cup of berries or a quarter cup of berries, excuse me. My, my glucose spikes goes from this to this, right? It's super wild. I put a link down below if you want to get a continuous glucose monitor and you want to be able to kind of watch this yourself. It beams it Bluetooth in real time to your phone. So it measures glucose in what is called the interstitial space. So in real time, you are getting a readout of what's happening and it's beaming it to your phone. Super, super cool. So the link down below will save you 15% off if you want to check them out. The cool thing is it's not just a continuous glucose monitor. It goes beyond that. So Cygnos uses really cool algorithms technology to kind of measure what your specific range is. So basically looking at the data, looking at where your spikes are, where your falls are, it can determine a specific range. So when you spike out of that range, you know you have more potential of gaining fat. And when you stay within your range, you know you're in a good spot. And it provides like adequate coaching to help you with it too. So if you're spiking, I'll get a notification on my phone. Like if I eat some ice cream and it spikes me out of that range, my phone will ping me and say, your glucose levels are spiking, you should go do some activity. It is really, really cool technology, and it's super affordable for regular people. It's not just one of these things that only biohackers that are making a million dollars can do. So I put a link down below for you to check them out, say 15% off Cygnos using that link down below. So something that would be interesting for you to test if you did have a CGM is the use of tannins. Now remember how I mentioned the berries with my ice cream? Well, berries happen to have tannins in them. So check this out. Tannins are gonna be in things like black tea, mint, rosemary, basil, uh, some coffee, and of course like, yeah, some of these other berries that you go down the rabbit hole of berries, like billy berries and things like that. Point is, is that anything that kind of seems like it'll stain your teeth <laughs> probably has a tannin in it because tannins can stain your teeth. But I'd rather have slightly tainted teeth than glycolated garbage in my, in my arteries, right? Now there was a study that was published in the British Journal of Nutrition that took a look at subjects that consumed, this is super wild, 35 grams of sucrose from a berry puree. So they pureed a bunch of different berries together totaling 35 grams of sugar. And then they had another group consume basically uh, equal carbohydrates, equal amounts of sugar, but not from berries, from other sources. Well, the berry puree group had a significantly less glucose spike and significantly less insulin response. What the heck's going on? Well, it's the same amount of sugar. Well, and you would think that a puree would just absorb like crazy but it is demonstrating that the tannins have a powerful effect. But there's another piece, and this opens up a whole different category I wanna talk about here, and that is going to be incretin potentiators, things that affect our gut hormones that affect satiety and also digestion. So in this study, they found that there was a higher glucagon-like peptide one, GLP-1 response with berries, meaning their gut hormones were increased more meaning that those gut hormones send a signal to slow digestion and also for satiety. So not only did it have a lower glucose response, but they probably were more satiated throughout the course of the day. This is flipping unreal, okay? Because something that would obliterate, like absorb so fast, is actually digesting slower and having less glucose response. So what are some other incretin potentiators in this category? Well, if GLP-1 is so good, then we wouldn't want it to break down. Ideally, we'd want GLP-1 circulating all the time, right? Okay, well, seaweed is interesting because seaweed has some components in it 
that actually block the breakdown of GLP-1. What this means is that GLP-1 elevates, but it remains circulating because it doesn't break down as quickly. The Journal of Food Science had published a paper demonstrating that seaweed has these small peptides in it that it affect uh, something called DPPIB, which is normally what breaks down GLP-1. God, this sounds crazy. You're probably thinking, there's a lot of letters and numbers and all this stuff. Point is, is that seaweed keeps those hormones floating around longer. The next one is less about pairing and more about something that you can simply do, okay? This is good news for those that like ice cream, like myself. Okay, simply eating slow makes a huge impact. There was a study that was published in the journal Endocrinology and Metabolism. They gave subjects uh, 675 calories worth of ice cream. That's like a pint of Rebel ice cream or like close to a pint of Ben and Jerry's. It's like, cool. Okay, and then they had them eat it in either five minutes or another group in 30 minutes. So I would have loved to be in the group that ate it in five minutes because that's pretty much how I eat ice cream anyway. But the point is, is that the group that ate it in five minutes had a big spike. The group that ate it in 30 minutes had very little spike. They actually ate ice cream and didn't have nearly as big of a spike as the five minute group. Okay, they also found their glucagon-like peptide levels and what's called peptide YY were significantly higher. Okay, this means that their gut hormones were circulating and they were remaining elevated, triggering more satiety, but also allowing for the proper digestion and not this out of control glucose response. Another thing that you can do is simply eating your protein first. And this is actually one of the most powerful things that you can do. Okay, by having your protein first before everything else on your plate or having a protein shake prior to having a bunch of carbohydrates, it's very, very powerful. There was a study that was published in PLOS1. I call this the ham sandwich study because it's, it's what it is. They had subjects eat a ham sandwich. Okay, but before the ham sandwich, they drank a bunch of water. Okay, then another group ate a ham sandwich, but before the ham sandwich, they had a whey protein shake. Okay. The ham sandwich group with water had a nice little spike in glucose and insulin response. The group that had the whey protein shake first had practically, like well, comparatively, a much smaller glucose spike and insulin response. They also found that the glucagon-like peptide one was way higher after having a whey protein shake. Okay, so we're affecting these incretins, we're affecting these gut hormones, and it's having a huge impact on the carbohydrates we eat after having some protein. Okay, but then there was a study that was published in the journal Diabetes Care, one of my, literally one of my personal favorite studies. Okay, they took a look at subjects consuming orange juice, ciabatta bread, some chicken, and some veggies, okay? Same amount of carbohydrates, calories, fat, protein in two groups. Okay, one group consumed the uh, carbohydrates first and then the rest of the stuff on their plate. Another group ate the chicken first and then the carbohydrates and everything. The group that had the chicken first 60 minutes after eating the meal, they had a 36% less of a glucose spike, okay? And it attenuated, it basically it drug out, it took them 35 minutes longer to basically reach that peak. So they ended up having such a dramatic improvement just by eating the protein first. So there's so much more to saying like this food is going to be high glycemic. If you looked at a kiwi, you'd say that's pretty high glycemic, but the fact that Maybe a kiwi combined with some yogurt that has some protein might be a completely different ball game. So you have to test for yourself, but you can't just trust the GI scale because it's largely flawed because it's not reality. None of us just eat straight rice or none of us just eat straight like puffed rice. Maybe we do occasionally, but we don't eat these singular things. We combine foods because that's what we do as humans. We are people that eat a large amount of food, diverse amount of foods over a longer period of time. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.